for coming. Um, five years after the uh, uprising that swept through the Arab republics in 2011, it is hard to argue that the people in these countries are faring any better than before, except maybe in the case of Tunisia. Um, my book deals with um, eight republics, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Sudan, and Yemen, which have long been characterized as authoritarian regimes. The book seeks to deepen the understanding about authoritarianism and coercive systems that prevailed in these countries in the belief that such knowledge is critical to making a successful transition. And my primary focus is, was really to understand how the system operated in each of those eight republics. And of course, with the failure and collapse of countries like Libya, Yemen, the protracted civil war in Syria, suggests that the demise of authoritarianism in the region is somewhat remote. So when I was doing the previous book on Iraq um, about the Saddam period, looking at the archives, I kept asking myself whether other Arab republics are similar or different from the system that existed in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, which lasted for 35 years. So ideally, I would have had to go and look at the archives of these other seven countries, and fortunately, they are inaccessible to any researchers. And therefore, I turned to memoirs written by those who were embedded in the system, political leaders, ministers, generals, security agency chiefs, party member, businessmen close to the, uh, to the power. I also examined memoirs of people who were on the outside, political opponents of the regime and political uh, uh, prisoners. I hope that uh, a combination of the two groups, the insiders and the outsiders, would help in the endeavor to learn about these uh, tyrannies, um, in spite of the fact that their ar archives are closed. And of course, all of them had secrecy, and w which was a normal thing, and dissent was severely uh, punished, so reliable information is not really readily available. Memoirs, however, can bridge the gap by revealing the inner functioning of organizations such as the military or security services. What I even found more interesting is all a lot of these memoirs give us insight about the relationship of the leaders with, their, uh, uh, with the people working with them. The book is actually thematic rather than allocating a chapter to each republic. It does not intend to be a historical review of events, but zooms in on certain episodes and trends through the prism of memoirs. It begins in 1952 with the Egyptian Revolution and ends with the Arab uprising in 2011, with a final chapter devoted to the a uh, difficult process of transition from authoritarianism. And for Tunisia, the only country that I think it is truly undergoing transition, I interviewed senior people from the previous regime, as well as current politicians, <coughs> academics, business people, to gain an insight into current issues and challenges. And because excellent work has been published on, our, on the Arab world and authoritarianism, to a certain extent, this really allowed me the luxury of studying memoirs to complete the uh, a picture of political history. I uh, used about 130 memoirs from the eight republics, 
as well as recent published testimonies from Tunisia. These testimonies, which began to be collected after the uprising, give remarkable insights into the hidden world of prisons and torture endured by many opponents of the previous regime, regardless of their political or religious beliefs. There, are no, there is no doubt that memoirs have significant drawbacks, and I detail them in a whole chapter separate about the, just the writing of political memoirs in the Arab world. Um, the book addresses a myriad of questions. How did the different regimes operate? What was the role of the military in countries, uh, uh, in different countries? How, what was the role of the ruling party in countries that pretended to be multi-party system, such as Egypt or Tunisia? To what extent was repression and violence used? How did the security services control and co-opt the different groups in society? such as labor and st student unions? How was the executive branch structured and how were decisions made? Was Saddam Hussein's cult of personality similar to that of Hafez al-Assad in Syria or Habib Bourguiba in Tunisia? And then finally, how did economic planning differ and how did economic decisions being made? So, Needless to say, you know, as a starter, there is a wide variety in, in history, politics, and economics between those eight republics. And the book strives to find common features or dissimilarities. And examining the nature of authoritarianism in the Arab republics, one common denominator is definitely prevalent among seven republics. And that is war and conflict in these countries. Two points to underline. First, the overwhelming majority of the leaders came from military backgrounds. Second, Tunisia, which is the only country transitioning, is also the only country that was not engaged in a military conflict in the last half a century and its army was kept out of politics since the mid-1960s. It becomes very clear that wars and conflict led to wasting vast wealth and human resources and indirectly enhanced the durability of these regimes. The history of authoritarianism in these eight republics stretches back before 1952. As provinces of the Ottoman Empire, they suffered from tyranny, and then as colonies of the British, French, and Italians in the late 19th and early 20th century, all were governed by authoritarian systems. When they became independent republics, they inherited remnants of despotism as well as limited institutional capacity. Many scholars have analyzed the problems of authoritarianism in uh, the region in eloquent terms. Prominent among them was Abdurrahman al kawakabi a Syrian official who lived between 1848 and 1902, and he vehemently opposed Sultan Abdul Hamid, one of the most tyrannical rulers of the Ottoman Empire. In a short but succinct treatise written more than a hundred years ago, entitled The Characteristics of Despotism, and the death of enslavement. al kawakabi discusses the various implications of despotism. He details the intertwining of tyranny on one hand and wealth and corruption on the other, and does not mince his words. And let me quote, if tyranny were a man who wanted to talk about himself, he would say, I am evil. My father is injustice, my mother is offense, my brother is treachery, my sister is misery, my father's brother is harm, my brother's mother's brother is humiliation, my son is poverty, my daughter is unemployment, my homeland is ruin, my clan is ignorance, my country is destruction. As for my religion, honor, and life, they are money, money, money. Yeah. Defining despotism 
Kawakibi asserts that it is dehumanizing and demoralizes the whole society and adds, it is an accountable and limited, arbitrary, self-serving and exclusive rule. It is served by the coercive military power of the ruler and the incapacitating ignorance of the rule. He also argues that political despotism is inseparably tied to religious despotism. In fact, when you read the stuff that he wrote, it is really hard to believe that he wrote those words 115 years ago. So what I thought today is give you one chapter, very summary, and then talk about different aspects of the memoirs. So I'm going to talk about a chapter about the security services, which without doubt the cornerstone of many of those regimes, both in establishing them and ensuring their durability. Each republic invested large amounts of money and effort to build loyal agencies that could withstand changes and be relied upon to uproot any opposition, imaginary or real. As a result, the number of functionaries and the network of informants expanded significantly in all these countries. Technical surveillance such as eavesdropping and filming devices were introduced to improve the efficiency of and accuracy of information gathering and to create a sense of omnipresence among the population. Fear was a powerful tool used by these organizations to bolster their authority. The miasma of fear permeated all levels of society, although it differed from one country to another. In some countries, such as Iraq, the regime was a Stalinist throughout its 35-year hegemony. In Syria, the levels of state repression varied from high intensity during the 80s to a relatively lower level of repression from the mid-1990s. But even in countries like Tunisia, which projected this image of more open society, people were always on guard from the long arm of the security services. But fear and coercion, critical as they are, constitute only one element in explaining the durability of these regimes. Because it is really hard to believe that all of them could last for three or four decades simply based on fear. Um, One thing that came up very interestingly from the memoir, that while the Arab world balked at developing a regional economic integration, there was considerable dialogue and cooperation between the different republics and kingdoms on matters of security and intelligence. In all these countries, the Minister of Interior was a powerful position In Egypt, after 2011 revolution, for example, it was reported that the ministry had 1.4 million employees and an estimated 700,000 informants on the payroll. Prisoners' memoirs are obviously insightful about the system of interrogation and everyday life in prisons. One of the most powerful was written by Mustafa Khalifa, a Syrian who endured 13 years of imprisonment and torture. In his remarkable story, al qawqa The Shell, he tells how he was arrested at Damascus airport on returning from six years of study in France. It took him almost three weeks of torture and beatings to find out what he was suspected of. He was suspected of being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood attempting to inform them that not only was he a Catholic by birth, but actually an atheist had no effect and in fact made it worse for him as his cellmates boycotted him after his declaration that he does not believe in any god. All these regimes accumulated colossal amounts of information about their citizens. One head of general security in Egypt, Fuad Alam, recounts how obsessive the gathering and filing of information had become and admits, and I quote, if someone passed by me and simply said, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, 
I would immediately write a memo and file it. <laughs> this is the correct method to safeguard our future, end of quote. However, the transmission of information to the leadership was often imperfect because of its sheer volume, and it was sometimes deliberately inaccurate or embellished to hide inefficiencies of overstated promises. Many of these agencies became ossified and thus became incapable of dealing with the type of onslaught that we saw uh, in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria. Political leadership was paralyzed mostly, and even when it received information, could not act on it. The disarray that took place in these countries very much echoed what happened in the communist Europe in the late 80s. I actually think that any discussion of what is happening today in the Arab world had to focus on the implications on the, of the violence and abuse that has been committed against the population in these republics for the last four decades. We need to better understand the complicated questions of accountability, reconciliation, and the possibility of reforming the security services. A description of the state of affairs in Eastern Europe after Stalin could easily apply to many of the republics discussed here, and I quote, societies for decades were composed of victims, perpetrators, and bystanders, the last burdened by tacit conformity and silence in the face of flagrant illegalities and immoralities. Individuals and whole communities were profoundly affected physically, materially, and psychologically often in ways that lie behind historical investigation and reconstruction." End of quote. In Romania, Ceausescu's brutal regime had a lasting effect on the psyche of his people. And as one Romanian com commented, if the past was full of terrible things, the future will be full of terrible things. People living under tyrannical regimes, whether Romania or many of these republics, will need a fundamental change if they are to transition to a true democracy. In his first address after becoming president of the Czech Republic in December 89, Vaclav Havel eloquently described life in his country in words that could readily apply to the population of the Arab republics. The worst thing is that we live in a contaminated moral environment. We fell morally ill because we became used to saying something different from what we thought. We learned not to believe in anything we ignore, in anything to ignore one another, to care only about ourselves. We had all become used to totalitarian systems and accepted it as unchangeable fact and thus helped to perpetuate it. The memoirs of Arab writers inform us of similar conditions, a system of lies, fear, sarcophancy, strong desire to protect one's family and survive under those regimes. The coercion and fear used by these <coughs> authoritarian regimes have serious implications. The question to be raised during the transition is whether accountability for what happened in the past will take place. After the Arab uprising, a blame storm, storming process began, whether in Tunisia or in Egypt. In the words of one observer, the participant apportioned blame to some figures of the ancient regime, discredit or champion of others. And Libya is really a case in point. In the last two years, a number of memoirs have been published by quite senior officials. All of them, without exception, say everything is Gaddafi and his two sons. The fact that one was a minister of interior, another one was a prime minister for 10 years, I guess they think they have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, um, but, but if you talk to experts, actually they will tell you who worked in Libya, 
that a major dilemma stemming from the previous regime legacy is the overwhelming number of perpetrators implicated in crimes committed during Gaddafi's era. Likewise, in the eyes of the masses, those identified with the old regime were many and had to be punished. And in essence, what is happening in Libya was a revenge at, at the beginning by the al thawar the revolutionaries, against those suspected of being part of the security services under the previous regime, and unwillingness to allow them to be part of the post-revolutionary system. Having a large number of these Tawar battalions without any chain of command, of course, exacerbated the main. Obeying orders was the main justification given by members of these regimes, whether in the Arab world or other authoritarian states. As one senior Syrian security official argued, that all those in the security services were mechanical robots executing orders. However, understanding the consequences of torture is pertinent to any successful transition. And in many countries, torture has a deep colonial past, such as Algeria, Tunisia, which inherited the French system, but the, with the passage of time, new methods were introduced and torture expanded and became ingrained in the operations of these security services. Torture was not the only component of coercion, having informants all walks of life, from all walks of life instilled deep fear and distrust among uh, citizens. The problem facing the Arab world today is similar to many other countries. Whenever a nation has experienced a dark chapter in its history, the question arises whether the past should simply be forgotten or whether it should be recalled and recorded for the benefit of the current generation. And with the Arab uprising, researching and understanding the past of such regimes is critical for the future. And the issue of reconciliation with the past actually is still hovering over some post-communist uh, uh, Europe more than 20 years later. Um, an individual complicity with the security services in countries such as Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Tunisia will continue to overshadow these countries uh, uh, for many years to come. Um, there is no guarantee that in post-authoritarian regime, the power of the security services will radically diminish. A new organs with different names will, might be set up, possibly with motives not so different from those envisaged by the original or, uh, authoritarian regime. This was evident in Iraq post-Saddam Hussein, where Prime Minister al-Maliki restructured the security services to strengthen his own position and allow him control over the security mechanism. According to one report, by mid-2009, more than 600,000 people were already employed in the security apparatus in Iraq. And al-Maliki followed the pattern of other authoritarian rulers by subverting the chain of command and ensuring that senior military officers and heads of security services were tied to him personally. And after the Arab uprising, some security agencies were significantly weakened, as in Yemen and Libya, because non-state actors stepped in to fill the power vacuum. In Libya, for example, the chasm between the various groups and regions has been growing, supported by different countries. Security sector reforms, whether in Egypt or Tunisia, is a key challenge for any transition. And with the return of the army rule in Egypt, any talk of reform has almost disappeared. And in Tunisia, the chances of a major reform are feeble since El Nida won the 2014 election. The lessons from other countries that indicate that even when conditions prevail, um, it is a complicated problem arises 
of how to administer justice to those directly responsible for past an act of repression. And I'm not going to really talk a lot about the legal system, but, you know, there is a lot of reticence to really deal with the past, to look at, at, at possibility it's of what happened in, 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 in the past, probably with the exception of Tunisia. Um, let me give you some conclusions. So, uh, although some dictators uh, introduced significant uh, social and education <coughs> reform, such as improving the status of women, making education compulsory, upgrading health services, infrastructure, the overall balance sheet of this social contract between leaders and citizens for the last five decades preceding the Arab uh, uh, uprising was negative. And I'm not trying to say it was all negative. In fact, during that five, six decades, there were different periods. I think the first two decades, there were really a lot of achievements, while the last decade or two decades, it was uh, 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 mostly negative. Furthermore, much of the progress achieved was obliterated by military conflict and civil wars in most of these countries, which they paid very heavy economic and social uh, price. Thus, in reviewing the history of tyranny, it would be almost impossible to come up with a positive scorecard for the dictator's policies. On the contrary, the catalog of almost unmitigated disasters in all spheres is probably too long to list. What is evident is that these rulers did not respect the basics of the social contract, and the engine of growth in their econo economies was very weak compared to the vitality of many other developing countries in Latin America or Southeast Asia. And as I said, the progress achieved was obliterated uh, by the war. The book argues that the eight republics have far more in common than was previously envisaged. Variation in degree of de uh, repression or denial of freedom is an important distinction, but does not alter the, the final picture. Attitudes toward violence may be differed. Some countries engaged more in political assassinations or public hangings, but all without exception in all republics induced uh, uh, torture and uh, uh, did not abstain from inflicting violence against their population. The system of repression they created um, was very comparable. They all penetrated their societies by planting informants at every level. And by the way, all eight republics, without exception, oppressed Islamic movements and tortured their members, irrelevant of their attitude toward the regime. Leadership was characterized by its centrality and the decision-making process was of the hands of the leader with a small cohort of advisors. But again, it is a mistake to pretend that it is only one person making all the decisions and all the moves during such a long time. One implication of this centrality, which is, uh, emerges, is really the lack of attention towards economic development. It seems economic management came to the fore mostly when a financial crisis erupted or workers went on a strike. In terms of economic management, the policies followed in these republics including those blessed with natural resources, were highly incompetent. So combined with this costly military adventures, the results were weak economic institutions, enormous waste of resources, and chronic lack of opportunities for large segments of the population. Thank you.